Welcome back to the Metric Stack Podcast. Today's guest is Ed Bryant, President and CEO of Samford Advisors. During his career, Ed has raised over $20 billion in equity and debt capital and completed over $10 billion in M&A transactions. He clearly knows a thing or two about company valuation. Today, we're going to be chatting with Ed about moving the needle on your company's valuation. My name is Alan Villa, and I'm joined, as usual, by my co-host, Lauren Thibodeau. Ed, a big welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Great to have you here, Ed. And before we dive too much into details, we'd love to just have you level set for us. Could you define valuation and tell us why it matters? That is a great question and one with many different answers, but I'll, I'll give you my answer. So I think you can either be very theoretic, theoretical with valuation. You can you know, approach it like when you're doing a company valuation, you go hire an auditor and they can do this, give you a 50-page report that tells you what they think your company is worth. I don't think you can, you know, that really is actually a, a, a real true reflection of value. And the only way you can see a true reflection of value is by actually going to market and getting bids from potential buyers. So, I mean, ultimately, valuation is the price that a potential buyer is willing to pay for your company, either to buy it outright as per, part of a merger and acquisition transaction or when you raise capital from a venture capitalist or angels or whatever it might be, there's a valuation of subscribe to those shares as well. So, but I, I think that theoretical exercise leads to a very different outcome typically to that market check. It's like almost like going to a real estate broker and saying, what's my house worth? Well, you, they don't know. They can put a number on it, but they won't really know until they take it to, to market. And it's even more like many times more complicated than that with a business, obviously, because it's, there's less comps, you know, to compare. There's not as many houses in the neighborhood to compare it to or whatever. So so ultimately, what I think is the ultimate check on valuation is actually going to market and getting get those bits. And, and the theoretical and the actual can be very different. So for today, for today's episode, we're, we're talking about real market, real world valuation. Now, those folks and those companies that have done the theoretical valuation what is what is the the use case where that actually does make sense? So a lot of times, so like if you're doing your year end audit, you might get a valuation for like stock options and those sort of things. You might get a valuation of the company done for goodwill. Like so, if you've acquired another company, like to value those intangibles and everything. But it's very much from an audit perspective, you know, kind of approach. The other thing would be if you've got external investors like a venture capitalist, the venture capitalist might do a valuation every quarter or every year to, to market to their, for their books and for their LPs and everything like that. But mostly the theoretical side of the business is purely for the kind of accounting approach to, to valuation. Okay, good good to know. We're going to take that, parcel it up, and, and we're, we're going to set that aside. Okay, so we're talking about real-world valuations. And, and really, when we talk about those, there's, there's sort of two types of buyers that often get talked about. There's the financial buyer, and there's the strategic buyer. What's, what's meant by that, and, and how can you sort of define those, those, two, those two angles? Yeah, typically, a financial buyer is a purely, like it says, a purely financial player. So a private equity firm, a venture capitalist, a family office, someone that purely does investing for a living, basically through whatever vehicle it is at whatever stage they invest in. A strategic buyer is normally a company buying another company. And it's more than, historically, it's been more than just a financial analysis. It's about you know what's the synergies between merging these two businesses what do you, you know what do you bring more than just the revenue you bring to the table what what else do you bring to the table that can accelerate my business in a certain way either through product or technology or sales or cross selling customers whatever it might be so that's typically the difference the reason i say the lines are becoming a bit blurred between the two is that a lot of the strategic buyers today are actually backed by financial players. So when we sell a business, it's normally sold to a strategic, but they think like a private equity firm, which is a very financial buyer. So, and I would also say a lot of the pure strategic, so like public companies like Apple, Google, whatever it might be, they unfortunately internally hire a lot of ex-bankers like myself. <laughs> 
on their stuff. So what becomes a strategic acquisition for someone like a Google is run the process of buying that company is actually run by a financial person who thinks much more like a financial player as well. So I think if anything, there's been this kind of convergence and almost professionalism of the strategics to bring them closer to the financials. So, so what are what what are, what are you saying here? Are you saying that the the strategics they they sort of think with their gut? They're more emotionally charged, you know. They 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 see the the good in this you know opportunity, and the financial buyers are these you know cold hearted you know calculated bankers that you know do everything by the book. Is is that sort of what we're to learn from this? Pretty much, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what well, what I would say is like if you think about a successful acquisition, right? The financial guys have it right. Like it's get rid of the emotion, right? Like let's boil it down to like buying a house. If you're buying a house and there's emotion, you're likely to overpay for that house. Like you know, like you fall in love with a house, you're pretty screwed in terms of just <laughs> you know the price you're going to pay relative to being rational, rational about it and everything. And it's the same for a business. So I think there is a separation of emotion and and financial approach and, and methodology is a is a big part of it for sure that the the difference is the two but i would say the strategics are becoming less emotional about it because they're hiring people like us right and so and and those voices within those organizations uh, organizations because they are now a lot of them backed by private equity it's quite a loud financial voice right the ceo might say we need to buy this but the private equity is like hang on, the math doesn't make sense. So there's a kind of a check on that emotion that that kind of could bid the price up. So. Interesting, interesting. And when you talk about emotion, I think of a founder or a CEO who's invested blood, sweat, tears, energy, building up this business. Talk about emotion put into there. How can we unpack that? What are some of the factors that a founder or CEO can control that are going to positively impact or negatively, I guess, valuation, emotion aside? Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a few factors, you know, as I, you know, I specialize in software and technology. So I'm going to kind of use these examples. Scale is really important. So a 1 million ARR business is a very different valuation, typically a discount valuation compared to a $10 million AR business. And so there's kind of stair steps in valuation based on scale. North of, you know, below 5 million, there's definitely a discount. 5 to 10, a lot less discount. And north of 10 million of ARR, typically no discount is the way I would Mm. simplify it. Now, all the other things being equal. So scale is important. Growth is important. And growth kind of varies a lot depending on the market conditions. So in COVID, it was all about growth and scale, and all the other metrics were kind of thrown out the window and people didn't care about them. Now it's growth with profitability. So profitability would be that kind of third thing that a CEO might have control over that can impact its their valuation. And then I say I would say the last two things are, are retention. So with a software business, retaining your customers, it's not just a metric, but it also shows how much of those customers love the product, right? If your retention is bad, it's usually because the product is bad or it doesn't fit with the market or there's a gap between product market fit, whatever it might be. But there's much more going on. A low retention score usually says a lot more than just it being a low retention score. And a high retention score, the other, you know, if you've got a net revenue retention of 130%, meaning you're upselling 30% more of your customers than a downgrading or churning, that's huge because it's validation for everything you're doing. You've got product market fit. You've got customers that clearly love you and are buying more of you. So I think those are the things that you might say, well, how do you control those things? Well, I think the best founders focus on the lowest hanging fruit first, right? So if it's retention, you're, you've got bad retention. Well, can you hire a business development rep or a customer service rep that is calling up accounts that are going to renew or whatever so that you get your retention up. We've seen that happen so that you're not like losing as much. Growth is much harder to control. Like you either that you kind of have it because you've got product market fit and you're really have been successful. So it's a, a bit of, you know, 
while I say it's within your their CEO's control, it's hard to really truly be within their control, especially when you get to scale and growth, which are the probably two things that impact the valuation the most. So now I think when we're talking about valuation, we're we're largely the lens that we're using, I think, is largely from an an, an, an acquisitive point of view. Mm-hmm. Now, does this differ when you're looking to raise funds from a venture capitalist? You know, and, and yes, you know, I think there's a, a discount when you're in the early stages, right? There's more volatility. But let's say, let's say you've 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 cracked the five million dollar mark and you're not necessarily looking to exit, but you're looking to raise your next round. Does the same math hold true? Is it is it still sort of, you know, growth, profitability, retention, all of those things? I, I, it's a great question. I think the probably the only real difference is profitability. So the venture capitalists don't care as much about profitability as later stage investors or potential acquirers of the business. And so, but they do care absolutely about what and scale. Like the venture capitalists will absolutely invest in businesses sub five million of ARR, like one, mm-hmm. two million. Mm-hmm. They'll do early stage investments in those things, but growth. Retention is really important because if you're again you're losing customers, something's wrong. Like something's not right, right? And then market size. Like where can this business go? If it's in a tiny TAM, it can only grow so much. And so I would say there's a lot of overlap with the exception of probably scale and and profitability. And why? And let's just unpack why is profitability so much more important to a company acquiring another company? Why is that part of the equation? Even, even though it might not be the, the first thing on their minds, maybe it's growth or maybe it's scale, but why is profit important? How do they factor that into their math? Yeah, I mean, they factor in because it basically gets added to the purchase price that they're going to pay, right? So let's say they pay $10 million for a business, but the business is losing $5 million a year, and it's going to take them three years to to get it to kind of break even, or it's going to be $15 million of losses before they can get it to break even, the acquirer would look at that and say, well, I'm really paying 25 million for the business. And so that either that has to come from somewhere. Either the acquirer says, okay, I'm okay with that and and I'll take that risk and I'll pay ultimately 25 million. Or they might say, well, I need a discount off the 10 million that I was going to pay the founders of this business to acquire it. So, and it shifts, right? It depends on the market. Like, the last couple of years, profitability, we sold many businesses that were not profitable and were burning a lot of cash, but they were growing. And that's all the buyers cared about. Even private equity buyers were happy to buy businesses that were losing money. I think as the market has become more cautious, you know, since interest rates have, have, have really risen, that has been a driver for, okay, well, it's got to be growing and profitable at the same time. So you'll hear, you know, a metric a lot of people are talking about now, a rule of 40. So that's your growth, revenue growth percentage plus your EBITDA margin percentage, is it above 40%? That's, I would say best in class is not a rule of 40 anymore. It's more like mm-hmm. rule of 50 or 60. So those two com- things combined, but it can't, especially for an acquisition, it can't all be coming from revenue growth. It can't be 50% revenue growth and 0% profitability. That's going to get a different, a lower multiple, I would say, than 40% revenue growth and a 10% EBITDA margin, if, if that makes sense. So, yeah, it absolutely does. So, you touch, let's go external for a minute. You touched on some things that to some degree CEOs can control. What about external factors? You touched on interest rate, but what are some of the external factors that impact valuation that we just need to have line of sight to? I mean, I think the biggest one is just MA is a cyclical business. It's a, like if you think about it from a buyer's perspective, a lot of the time they don't have to do the MA. Like, you know, if there's a hundred MA deals that are happening right now a month in North America on the software side, I would say 90 of them are discretionary, right? Like there's 10 of them where they're, they're like, we have to do this deal, otherwise our company was really gonna suffer or we're gonna die or whatever it might be. 90% of it's more like it's a nice to have, not a need to have. And because of that, you can turn the tap on and off. Kind of whenever you want, right? So it's definitely a discretionary expense. It's definitely cyclical. We are going through a slower period right now. You know, after what was a real boom, like 2020, 21, 22 were huge years. Like just the deal creation and the volume of deals that were getting done was like 
in two and a half years, we did 10 years business, basically, mm-hmm. right? And so that had to come to a stop at, at some point, and interest rates were the trigger for that. But I would say the biggest thing that you can definitely not control, and you just kind of have to weigh out, is market conditions. And, and it's a very cyclical business. What is interesting, though, is it seems like the cycles are getting a bit shorter in terms of the down cycles, because mm-hmm. there is so much money that's been raised dedicated to to buying software businesses. So there's there's hundreds of funds in the US mostly that are dedicated to buying software business. So private equity firms that just have a mandate to buy software and they have raised tens of billions or hundreds of billions of capital over the last five years. And they have to deploy it at some point, otherwise they give it back, right? That kind of makes them the cycle shorter than they have been historically because there is so much money that has to still be de- de- be deployed. So, th- so that's interesting. So the strategics might have the luxury of sitting out or being patient and not deploying, but the financially motivated PE companies, they have a mandate. And in times where they have not invested their cash, they've got this, this balloon of funds that somehow needs to be deployed. So yeah, I think that's that is quite interesting. So maybe the 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 shift of power, you know, comes and goes if you're trying to sell your company or if you're trying to buy companies. Yeah, abs- yeah. And uh, sorry, I'll, I'll I'll finish the thought for you. Like, so we, in 2020, I'll give you an example. 2020, the shutdown happens in February, March. The first calls we're getting in May and June are from private equity. Like the strategics are nowhere yeah. until the end of that, like September, October they're much more cautious they don't have to deploy and they're not calling right and then they're they're calling much later so there is yeah a very recent example of the private equity guys coming back to us much quicker than the strategics yes let me let me actually just do a bit of a sidebar as well because i'm just thinking when you talk about valuation you know you you picture you picture a a a number in your mind you know is it is it 20 million is it 50 million is 100 million whatever it is but of course that number is not necessarily what the company gets. You know, there's often terms that come along with any kind of ac- acquisition. So maybe just a quick sidebar on kind of what are, the, what are the typical terms that, you know, if somebody says valuation, I've got a valuation of X, it's not as cut and dry as, as, as just, oh, we're going to get $20 million in the bank as soon as this deal is over. You know, what, what are some of the things that a founder or a CEO would have to think about? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question as well. Like, there's so many components to it, right? So the headline value might be the 20 million that you mentioned, but it might be 10 million of cash. There might be five million of an earnout, or there might and there might be five million of stock. So there's a lot of different ways that that 20 million pie can be sliced up between those different components. In in bull markets, the deferred things like stock and 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 earnouts definitely decline. And the cat. So the last couple of years, we were pretty much selling most of our clients for all cash at close. So the 20 million would be in your bank account the day it closes. Mm-hmm. Now with a little bit more caution and a little bit more, okay, show me that, you know, I should believe your projections and that you're really going to do what you say you're going to do. I'll give you 15 of cash and five of, of, of equity or five of an earnout. And an earnout basically is, okay, hit these revenue goals, EBITDA goals, customer goals, integration goals, whatever the goal is, you hit the goal, you get paid the extra money, usually deferred over one, two, up to, you know, three, three years or so. But we're definitely seeing more earnouts in this kind of market and more, okay, we want you to kind of share that risk. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, I almost say it's a it's a, a show me market versus a tell me market. Don't <laughs> tell me what you're going to do. Yeah. Show me what you're going to do and have skin in the game that reflects that. Oh, I love that. I love that. So in a show me scenario like that, where you need to hit certain goals post, let's say it's post acquisition, let's say it's a purchase by another company and you need to perform. What are some things that you've seen go horribly wrong? <laughs> what are some things that you would counsel founders to make sure they do even ahead of the transaction to set themselves up for success? I think... Give yourself more time in an earnout. Is it you know? It kind of sounds counterintuitive because let's say you have a deal and they say, okay, we're going to give you a one year earnout. You hit this revenue goal and then you get paid out. Well, everyone wants their money sooner. But the problem what I've seen with earnouts is 
the expectation of like integration of the two businesses, get in their sales force to sell your product and really to get things humming, it always takes longer. So a lot of the time, my coaching is more like, okay, they've offered a 12-month burnout. now. It's counterintuitive, but why don't we make it 24? Ed, Ed I, think that's, I think that's the first time I'm, I'm hearing this. I think this is, this is brilliant. I think you're absolutely right. Everybody would say, let's make it as short as possible. But you're right. These things, <laughs> they take time. Yeah, they do. And most of the earnouts that I've seen not get paid out because they're 12 month burnouts and <laughs> like just, or, or you expecting certain traction on certain, a new product or whatever it might be. And just, as we know it as founders, things always take longer than you expect. And so that's, you know, so we do things where we might say, okay, you've got to hit this revenue goal, but you've got two years instead of one to hit it. But if I hit it early, I still get paid. So you're kind of getting mm-hmm. the best of both worlds. It's a two year run out, but it could become one if I do better than than I thought I was going to do and it just buys a little bit more time and and I think that's the that's the biggest piece of feedback that I would have about any deferred compensation for, on a transaction the other piece would be I've seen other founders take equity instead of an earn out in the combined company and a lot of the time the buyer values their equity very different to the way you value your equity and getting it at a good price is is key right because they might value themselves at 10 times they value you at five times and you basically get diluted by the difference and you've gotten less percentage of the company so that when something does happen later on down the road you've got less material stake in it so relative value becomes really important if you're taking equity instead of like an earnout or whatever now i've 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 seen the flip side as well where a smaller company gets acquired and it's that tech or that company that actually ends up being the lion's share of the future revenue. Now, maybe this is sort of a, a mystical, wonderful scenario that you know everybody dreams of. But you know, have you seen that? You know, and and are there any differences that you can share if if you've seen scenarios yeah. like that? I have. Is but it's normally when the buyer is smaller, right? So if if you have five, 10 million revenue business and you get bought by Google, you're like a pinprick on a, on an elephant, right? Like not, you're like, so, but if you're doing five or 10 million of revenue and you're bought by someone that's doing 40 or 50 million of revenue and you can be more material. And yeah, I've definitely seen that where the, the business that's bought actually has better salespeople, has a better product, whatever it might be. And it's slowly transitioned to be the ultimate piece of software that's left in the equation. But I think it's relative size of the business that really determines that. So are there common mistakes or common blind spots that you see founders have? You've covered a lot of good ground already. Are there other things you see that if you if you could provide wise counsel earlier that you would say to founders? There's a couple of things. So I think a lot of people when when they talk to us, they talk, oh, well, I don't want a financial valuation. I want a strategic valuation and my technology is worth so much. So my metrics, my growth, my retention, that that doesn't matter. I've got great technology and that's what I will be bought for. And what they forget is what I said earlier is those metrics tell a lot more than just the financials of the business. They tell a lot about the technology of the business, right? Can you sell it? No one's buying it then maybe you don't have product market fit, right? So I think we hear that a lot. Oh, well, this is a te- this would be a technology acquisition. And, and so they're blinded by the technology and they're ignoring the metrics of the business that speak volumes about how good is the technology. And I, I get that so much and that disconnect, especially for technical founders of the technology is fantastic. Well, why is no one buying Right. Like that, that's for me is the biggest thing. Or why can't you keep a customer past a 12 month contract? As soon as their contract comes up, they don't renew. That speaks volumes for me. So I think, you know, being focused on tracking those metrics of the business as well as the technology and not just pouring everything into product, but listening to those signals outside of, of the product is just as critical. And I think that's a mistake that a lot, especially technology founders have because they're much more technology minded than sales minded or whatever it might be. Yeah, well, Ed, you know, I mean it's it's very true. We uh we we do get sort of, 
you know, fairly attached and in love with our technology. So I, I can't, I can't uh, say that, that uh, that's untrue. Let me ask you a different question. So there's, there's folks that value the tech. I've also heard of multiples that have been factored by the number of employees you have. So, you know, you have, you have nothing that would make a buyer run to the hills. So you've got good tech, you've got, you know, good product market fit, et cetera. But is there also a, a way of calculating your valuation based on, hey, we've got, we've got 100 employees, they should, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do a down, downsizing before the acquisition because it's really, you know, it's X dollars per employee that we're getting valued on. How, where is that? Or is that a, also sort of a cyclical buying thing? It's a bit cyclical with the exception right now of AI. So like, you know, obviously there's a big mad rush among all the biggest technology companies to really implement AI across their whole tech stack and their businesses. And so if you're a hundred person AI firm with 90 data scientists and AI experts, that can be definitely valuable. So we've seen that before where we've had offers from, we had an offer actually from one of the big four technology companies purely for data scientists and then they priced it per head for the data scientists. But it, it that is cyclical as well. And it's, you know, so it's, I would say it applies to AI right now, but with the kind of loosening of the tech market now that's going on and the, the labor market not being quite as tight as it was, I think it's less important today than it might have been a year or two ago. So, uh, Ed, we're going to, we're going to have to wrap it up soon, but I wanted to ask, you know, so we're, we're doing this recording at the end of November. So just to put a date stamp on when the recording was done, what's, what's your prediction for what markets, what valuations are going to do in the tech space, you know, over the next 12 to 24 months? I, I think what well, in the current market, I'll start there and then where we can go in the current market is what I call a bifurcated market. There's a lot of formerly VC-backed companies that raise a lot of capital but haven't found true product market fit and are running out of cash. They will get low multiples or, or close down or merge, whatever it might be. And that's going to continue for a while because there's a lot of those businesses, vintage VCs, 2020, 21, 22, that have still got to kind of flush through the system. And that that will kind of happen over the next 12 to 18 months, I think. We're already seeing 18 months of that happening, and I think we're kind of halfway through that. On the other side of the market, when you bring a really good business that meets all the metrics that we talked about earlier, the valuations are pretty close to peak, like I would say 20% off peak. They're not as bad as the, you know, the, the broader kind of public software company valuations and how much they've deteriorated. So it's a pretty good market for healthy software businesses right now. We, it feels like right now, the last couple of months, what we've been talking about a lot internally here at Sanford is it feels a lot like April, May, June of 2020, when the phone started to ring again, you know, and like, it's been quiet, there's been pockets of activity, but now it seems to be a little bit more ubiquitous that there's a lot more people coming inbound to us and saying, what do you have? Like, you know, can, or we're interested in buying this type of asset. Do you know anyone that kind of fits the bill? And so we're seeing that. So maybe it's just the optimist in me, but I, I think that 2024 will actually be quite a good year and, and will be a good recovery year in terms of volume, both the number of transactions completed and, and the actual total dollar va value of the, the M&A markets for software and tech. So I was just going to say, just before we close out, are there resources? I mean, founders, CEOs want to know, are there resources people can can look at to stay current on valuation and trends uh, in the space? Yeah, so self-servingly, we put out something monthly on our social and everything that's about VC and M&A valuations. So we cover both. We have a monthly market report that we distribute, which I'm happy to sign any of your listeners up to. But there's also a lot of the VCs that creating a lot of content now to differentiate themselves and the private equity firm. So um, one I love is Thomas Tungst. He's a venture capitalist. He publishes an article every week at least and looks a lot about public valuations and what trends they're seeing. So I would definitely follow people like that. But I think the community is publishing a lot more content to differentiate themselves as well. And so other M&A advisors, the VC community, the private equity community, there's a lot of great content. And so I would get signed up for as many of those lists as I can. I, I 
I, I digest as much of that as I can every month and, and really good content, especially, especially from Thomas. So Ed, this is fantastic. And, and for all the listeners out there, I do subscribe to Ed's newsletter and it is chock full of good information every time it comes out. So Ed, again, thank you so much, uh, everybody, Ed Bryant, CEO of Samford uh, Advisors. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks very much for having me. Great to have you here. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed today's conversation about metrics and data, be sure to check out Metric HQ, our online resource for the metrics that matter most to you and your business.